financial reward for my efforts. The hell what I do for free. Because when you're doing what you love to do, when you do it for free, your work is your play. And if your work is your play, you'll never work a day in your life. And I'll mark it back to all the interviews I had. I did the last night interview John Johnson of Ebony Magazine. And there I am, and I'm in his office there on South Michigan Avenue in Chicago, right across from his desk. And I said, Mr. Johnson, you weren't publishing Ebony Magazine. What would you be doing? And he had a mock issue of an upcoming issue. Right there in front of him. He went just like this. He picked it up and went, magazines, I love the colors, I love the feel, I love the textures. How the world are you going to be the man like that? <laughs> then I go up to New York and I'm there with Walter Turnbull, founder of the Harlem Boys Choir. And I said, Dr. Turnbull, I want to ask you a question that you're very rarely asked. He said, go ahead, far away. I said, what is it about? What is wealth to you? You know what he said to me? He said, wealth is hearing the voices of my boys. And then I'm in New Jersey, man. Lean on me, Joe Jersey. Clark. Have you seen the movie? <laughs> Joe Clark, lean on me. And I said, Joe, any regrets? He said, regrets about what? You know when you took those 300 students and you had them on the risers your first day of class and you threw them out the class? He said, I don't know, I ain't no regrets. He said, what the movie didn't show, it didn't show the faculty and administrators I had to throw out of this school. And I said, why would you do that? He says, this is my alma mater. I sat in these seats, and the superintendent hired me for one reason and one reason only. And I said, what is that? He said, the story of a love. So what are you doing? What do you love to do? And if you can't answer those three questions openly and honestly, Go to somebody you would respect. Just like uh, Reggie Hammond. Go to somebody you respect, somebody that you admire. And ask them, what do you see me as? What do you think I would be good at doing? So, this is what I'm good at doing. After this, a past class, Clark Atlanta University, my class, blah, blah, blah. You've heard the story before. When I was a junior undergrad, what did my fraternity brothers call me? They called me the professor. Why? What is that about? But they couldn't find me on campus. What's good? Well, he's in the lab. He didn't call the study hall. He didn't call the library. He called the lab then. He's in the lab. lab. Right. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach. Now, I told the last time I spoke to this group, we were over a pastor, right? And if you remember, I said, everybody on that campus knows my classroom. Why? Because I got a sign on the door. They took my sign down. They were painting, man. Put the sign back up, huh? <laughs> got a sign on the door that reads, if you don't want to work hard, you don't belong here. And if you don't want to leave, listen to me, entrepreneurs, if you don't want to leave, under no circumstances, walk through my door. And then if you come into my door, let me get my click, if you come into my door, and you take about five steps, you turn to your right, and there's another sign on the wall that reads, mediocrity is not the standard in this place. Yeah. You can be mediocre someplace else, but you can't be mediocre here. That's a part of your area of excellence. And why do we have a toast? Because when you are excellent at what you do, when you are the best at what you do, two things you never have to worry about. Number one, you never have to worry about employment. And number two, you never have to worry about income. The marketplace will seek you out. Everybody wants to be associated with the best. You think of hotel, what do you think of? Think of the Marriott, think of the Ritz Carlton. When you think of a sports team, what do you think about? I think about Notre Dame Fighting Irish, New York Yankees. When you think about a car, what do you think about? I think about Lexus, I think about Mercedes-Benz, I think about Rolls Royce. But when the marketplace thinks about you, what comes to mind? Somebody, entrepreneurs, <laughs> listen, better get excited about your life, and you better pray it's you. So there you are, the clicker, does the clicker work? Is my clicker working? Boom! <laughs> okay, got it.
right, what are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial leadership? This is my MBA class. These are the six key points. You don't have to focus on all of them. But if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you better be driven. You better be driven. There are 50 million different desires. People ask me all the time, what's the difference between a desire and a burning desire? We all got 50 million different desires. My wife has a desire, she wants to paint the deck. She wants to go get a new sofa, this, that, and everything. We all got 50 million different, different desires. But what is a burning desire? Burning desires are inner candle, inner flame that cannot be extinguished. And though the works may go before you, the doubters come, the haters come. What did Jay Z said? I knew I was making headway in the music world. Why? When the haters were coming after me. When the cynics, you can't do this, you can't do that. What are they trying to tell you? They're just looking, you know, I'm trying to get you, trying to find company with you, whatever. Driven. Number two, the work is a calling. Richie Hammond just talked about that. Career is what you're made for, but a calling is what you're made for. So what have you been called to do? Why are you here? Come on, entrepreneurs, if you live the normal life, 74, 77 years on earth, do the calculus. You get 30,000 days. That's all you get. 30,000 days on earth. That's good, bro. What in the world are you saying? I'm saying time is not running out when your life is. So what is the entrepreneurial question? The entrepreneurial question is, what are you going to do with the rest of life that you have left? What are you going to do? Here I am. I'm working in the corporate America. I was the first black male in the rotational program for Texas Instruments in Dallas, Texas. Then I went to left to go to Philadelphia. I was the first black male in the rotational program for Smith, Klein, and French. And here it is, the early 1980s. I was almost knocking on what, 55, 56 thousand dollars a year, getting two signing bonuses, company car, and everything. But I wasn't satisfied. I knew this was not me. So what did I do? I took two sick days. Didn't go to work, and I went in my garage and I took large butcher's sheets of paper, and I lined the walls in my garage, and I forced myself to write my life goals. For two days, on the first sheet, the number one goal. What's the number one goal? My number one goal was bring Pat home from work. But why? Now why was that number one? Because I knew I wouldn't be free until the girlfriend was free. So what have you been called to do? Look at that. Not an easy path. Not an easy path. But what do we know about persistence? Persistence, you know, well, not an easy path. Persistence is the level of belief that you have in yourself. And you've got to remember, it's not what you're going through, it's what you're going to. And if you do it right, you only got to do it one time. You only got to do it one time. Look at Kathy Yu, who spent two days with her, one of your seven black billionaires, I may add. When she bought her first radio station in Washington, D.C., restroom down at the end of the corner, that was, uh, you know, the restroom that she and her son bathed in every day. They ate off a hot plate. For one year, she slept on the floor of that radio station. And I asked her, I said, oh my goodness, what was going through your mind, man? How in the world did you do it? She said, nothing but the grace of God. Think outside the box. Think outside the box. If everybody in the organization is thinking along the same lines, well, no one is thinking. Don't you know the average individual in our society gets four ideas a year, any one of which, if you have the guts, the courage, the fortitude to chase your dream, will make you financially independent. So where do you do your best thinking? I mean, I spoke at a retreat two weeks ago, juvenile court, justice, and blah, blah, blah. And I told the director, this is smart. What you're doing here is very smart. You got to ask this man, you know, Jay, where do you do your best thing? You ask me, look at me, where in the world do you do your best thing? Well, my best thing, it always comes in the class. I go home, hug, kiss my wife, go in the refrigerator, get a cold brewski, walk out on my deck, pop that can, and just let my mind roam as I'm looking through the woods. So if you want my best thinking, we gotta take a retreat, man. I don't care. Now we go. We gotta go someplace. Get this boy out in the woods with a beer, since I can. That's the only way I'm gonna get his best thinking. Do 
Do more than what is expected, more than what is required. Do more than what is expected, more than what is required. Because what we're talking about, we're talking about personal empowerment. Personal empowerment. You want to be empowered? There's only two things you got to do. Number one, when given a task or assignment, always complete it to the best of your ability. Always. You hear me, entrepreneurs? You never know who's looking. And when you do it, do it with a flair. Do it with a flair. My mind goes back years ago. I had a presentation in, in Detroit. It was on a presentation, Saturday evening, blah, blah, blah. And I had another presentation back here in Atlanta, Sunday afternoon. And I knew the only way I was going to make that presentation back here in Atlanta is first thing smoking out of control. So after I got through, they had me crying at me at the Ritz Carlton. And I went back to the hotel and I said, listen, man, I, got, I need a wake-up call. And beyond the wake-up call, I need a, a carry car, blue limousine car, somebody from be there taking the airport. I can't miss this flight. The concierge said, concierge said to me, you know exactly, we're going to get your car. We know exactly what we're going to get you. I said, great. He said, we're going to get you a yellow cab. I said, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, time out, pump the brake, brother. I, 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 I'm not feeling this yellow cab. So I said, I did a little bit, make sure I'm definitely going to be there. I said, here, bro, relax. You know exactly what we're going to get you. Okay? So that flight was like 5.55 in the morning. I got up three something close to four, looking like a, you know, a road boy, didn't comb my hair, didn't shave, wearing, you know, athletic apparel, and blah, blah, blah. And I went down the lobby, and what did I see? There's a black woman, full chauffeurs driven, you know, uniform on. She had the hat, she had the tie, everything, blah, blah, blah. And I said, man, I'm glad they got me a limo. I said, yes. Yeah. I said, can I get you my this? And I said, well, female. I said, no, I got this. I said, no, please, not me. I said, okay, great. She got it, walked out the wrist call, and there was the shiniest yellow cat. Then <laughs> 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 you could shave in a arm wall on that top, on those top. <laughs> she flips the trunk, she takes that, you could eat out the back of the floor. In the trunk of that home. And she seats me in the back, and we're driving out of the parking lot. And as we're driving out, she says, uh, I don't know if you're thirsty. I got uh, fruit juice right there. I got Dasani. I got bottled water. And if you really like Perrier, there's some Perrier on the ice and this can open right there. I said, Whoa. <laughs> And she says, um, you know, I got magazines, I got Forbes, I got Fortune, I got Friday's Wall Street Journal, it's dated, but, you know, feel free to read it, and I'm driving on. She says, uh, what type of music do you want to hear? And she opens up her little briefcase, and she says, I don't need CDs. She says, I got rap, I got hip hop, I got rhythm and blues. It is Sunday, do you want to hear gospel? And so I said to her, I said, wow, so we were just talking back and forth on the way to Detroit Metro. I said, how long have you been doing this? When did you get this idea I mean, to run your business like this? She said, well, my neighbor, you know, this was this cab at one time, and he got sick, and he let me ditch it for him, you know, a couple of times, and then until he got lengthy, he came home, he gave up, and then about a month, and I said, if this was my cab company, I know exactly how I would run it. And I said, well, he decided to sell it to me, he sold it to me. You wouldn't believe the business CEOs at that time in Detroit that Use her instead of their own demo drops. <laughs> so she dropped me all curbside Delta Airlines and she said, Mr. Kimber, I got one thing to confess to you. And she reaches in her briefcase and she pulls out a bragging book. You got a bragging book? Come on, entrepreneurs. You don't have a bragging book? <laughs> now, listen, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, now it's time to get up on the rooftops and shout at the top of your lungs, I'm the best, I'm the number one. Let me prove it to you. Don't be like that good man. Don't be like that guy looking for this rare special bird. This guy went all across the world looking for this rare special bird. Why? Because this bird could speak three different languages. And he finds the bird at a pet store right around the corner from the house. And he tells the pet store owner, uh, my wife will be home today. Have the bird delivered to my house, and I'll pay you when I get home. He comes home from work, and he says to his lovely wife, dear, did the bird come today? She says, yeah. He said, well, where is it? She said, it's in the oven. 
He said, no, you need to tell me you put that bird in the oven. Don't you know that bird can speak three different languages? And she said, why did it speak up? <laughs> when are you going to speak up, entrepreneur? Now, if you ever want to find a bragging book, or go to any NFL, go to any major league baseball, go to any NBA agent. And the first thing they, you know, they develop for the client is a bragging book. A bragging book. So when the times get low, when you stub your toe, when you get turned, when they wave their hand at you over a contract, when you just lost a client, how are you going to double your efforts? How are you going to regain that second win? And then last but not least, let's make things happen. Let's move right along. Ever so quickly, looking at Steve Jobs, yes, and what do we know about Steve Jobs? If you haven't read the book, you probably need to go read his biography written by Walter uh, Jacobs, Isaacson, rather, one of my favorite writers of Time Magazine. And the only reason why I'm showing you Steve Jobs, because he gives you the four reasons why to be a business entrepreneur, and not one you've got to do with money. No one! According to Steve Jobs, number one reason to be a business, don't build a business, build a movement. Build a movement. What does Harvard B School say? If you can't see yourself in this line of work 20 years from now, don't do it. They tell you to take a 20-year approach. Build a movement. That's what I tried to do. Is it up there? I tried to build it. I tried to build it. When I got my fancy PhD degree, listen, I, my dissertation is on wealth and poverty. And the best advice I got from one of my committee members at Northwestern is said, Dennis, don't look at this as your dissertation, look at this as your first book. And I was granted at that doctor, and I immediately turned to the girlfriend and I said, Pat, I love my first book. And I said, but I don't want to study anything about poverty. And I don't want to study anything about nation states. I want to study, you know, high achieving African Americans. I don't care whether leaders, entrepreneurs, wealth creators. That's all I wanted to do. Build a movement. See yourself. Take the long range approach. Number two, what does Steve Jobs say? He said, you know, make it easy for people to do business with you. Make it easy for people to do business with you. 21 different ways in the market to sell a product or service. 21. What are you using right now? I stand before millennials all day. They only want number 21, which is internet. But there are 20 other different ways for people to make, you know, for you to develop, sell your product or service. Number one is word of mouth. Number 20 is TV. Number 19, radio. 18, magazines. Number two, flyers. Go to the AUC, you got the brother standing right there and hand him on the young lady suppliers. Number four, advertising on a bench at a bus stop. Number seven, advertising on top of a truck. It's going to say, why would anybody want to advertise on top of a truck? You can't even see it. Well, if your business is near an airport, that's the only way they're going to see it. Jerry Jones. What was going through Jerry Jones' mind when he built that stadium in the Dallas Cowboys? He said, the only image I want to see is how my stadium is going to look from the Goodyear Blue. <laughs> Don't put the AT&T logo on the side. I want the AT&T logo on the top. Make it easy for people to do business with you. So I tell my millennials, man, come on, man, all you're thinking about is internet, that's good. I love digital marketing. I do a little PowerPoint presentation on digital marketing. But you've got to understand digital marketing. you got a smartphone? This is my smartphone right over there. As soon as you boot up during the day, I don't care if you've got Samsung, Apple, whatever, there are 4.5 billion people online with you. Now, how are you going to use that forum? How are you going to use that target market? Mark Zuckerberg came up with Facebook. When Chad Hurley came up with YouTube. What the hell do we know about YouTube? Every year, Hollywood produces 500 movies, right? YouTube does it every 26 minutes. 
When Evan Spiegel came up with Snapchat, when Reed Hoffman came up with LinkedIn, when Jack Dorsey came up with Twitter, when Elon Musk came up with PayPal, when Clinton, when what? Clinton uh, came up with what? Uh, Instagram? They came up with these social media platforms so some poor girl in Bangladesh can have added drinking water. Some poor child in Johannesburg, some of that school uniform so she can go to school. They did not come up with these social media platforms for us to gossip. Make it easy for people to do business with you. Meet them where they are. Number three, according to job. Oh, this is a good one. Number three, according to fulfill the dreams of your clients. Number three, fulfill, in other words, you got to be able to sell. You need to burn that in your subconscious. Look at that, Q plus Q plus MA equals C. The quality of your service plus the quantity of your service plus the mental attitude in which it is rendered always equals compensation. And don't you dare ever sell needs and wants. Don't come to me. Marketing 101, what's the number one goal of marketing 101? Marketing 101, make my eyeballs move. That's the number one goal of marketing, make my eyeballs move. Don't you dare talk about needs and wants. Don't give people what they need or want, give them what they want to feel. Why didn't you buy those Nikes instead of Adidas? Man, make me, I felt athletic. <laughs> Whoa! You know, why did you buy, you know, the Apple instead of the Samsung? Man, I got that iPhone and I just feel innovative, feel entrepreneurial, I feel creative. Why did you buy Victoria's Secret instead of one of Man, because when I wear Victoria's Secret, I feel confident. I feel as if I'm in control. I feel I'm the boss lady. Q plus Q plus MA equals C. Sooner or later, you got to be able to sell. And what do we know about selling, man? People don't care about you until they realize how much you care about them. <laughs> Under no circumstances, let the nice customer ruin your business. See, the nice customer will sit at the table, wait for his or her order to be taken, while the waiter's on the phone talking to his buddies. A nice customer will do that. The nice customer will sit at the table and drink the red wine when she specifically asks for white. Nice customer will do that. The nice customer will sit at the table, eat the well-done steak when he requested red. A nice customer will do that. But the nice customer never comes back. <laughs> never comes back. Just because you got the order on Monday doesn't mean you get the order on Tuesday. And if you did get the order on Tuesday, I need to know why you didn't get the order on Tuesday. I need to know why you didn't get the real order. What did you do wrong? What did you do that was completely and totally incorrect? And then last but not least, and here we go right there. Bang. Number four, according to Steve Jobs, when you can't focus on those first three, when you can't listen, you first need to talking about building a movement, then talking about, you know, uh, selling, and then last but not least, when you can't focus on those first three, you focus on number four, and this is the heart of entrepreneurial leadership. This is why this program exists. Number four, according to Steve Jobs, is, oh my goodness, total craft mastery. Total craft mastery. I got another sign in my classroom that reads, if you don't read, if you don't study, if you don't grow, if you don't develop, if you don't go to conferences, if you don't go to the seminars, if you don't take good notes, somebody else out in the universe will. And the day you meet that other person, you lose. Now, why is that critically important? Because, well, money is just like water. Water seeks its own level, right? Well, so does wealth. So does money. And we see it all the time. If you're growing and the money isn't there, relax, calm down, take it easy. That wealth, prosperity, and abundance is right around the corner. It has to connect. If your money is growing and you're not, red flag, you're about to be 
you're one of those athletes and hip hop or entertainers, you won't have the money long. You won't have the money long. It's a one to one correlation. So sit up. I show a PowerPoint presentation in my class, my little millennials, and I show them a picture of Jay Z, Dr. Dre, and Tony Obi. And I say to myself, what these three folks got to have in common? Oh man, I'm just gonna go hit the bank. Like, hey man, that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a music mogul. I'm gonna be just like that. I said, no, what do they really have in common? She, I, I don't know. They took four to six weeks out of the busy schedule to take an executive management <coughs> class at all. That's what they have in common. And if you ever take a certification class at Harvard, ain't no flying in Monday, let me leave Friday afternoon, cut a little short Thursday, going back out to the West Coast, I'm still on tour. Uh-uh, ain't none of that. You're there for six weeks. And so there I am with Antonio Reed. I'm sitting down and I said, Antonio, man, you will baby face make more money in your lifetime. If you live 10 lifetimes, you could spend all the money. Well, whatever need you, compel you, motivate you, take an executive management class at Harvard. He said, well, number one, this music business is a business. But number two, I learned a long time ago, the moment I cease to grow and develop, that's when I begin to die, and that's when I'm going to begin to lose my business. So there you are, and then last but not least, and then you're talking about, there's Damon John, about branding. You keep your brand strong. You keep your brand strong entrepreneurs. What do we know about a brand? That's the only way that you're going to develop your USB. What do we know about a brand? Your brand is your name, your voice, your appearance, your dress, and the content of what you have to say. Now why is that critically important? Because that brand leads to your USB. Well, what is a USB? Well, you, we know it has a unique selling proposition. Well, what is your unique selling proposition? That is your brand selling in the marketplace even when you're not there. Even when you're not there. I don't care if you go to Lowe's, let's build something you can do. Let's go to Home Depot, you can do it, we can try, let's save money. I don't care if you go, you know, hey, James Kelly, UPS, or Brown, what can Brown do for you? I don't care if you go ask Bill Knight and Nike shoes, let's just do it. I don't care if you ask Fred Smith or Federal Express, absolutely positively must be there overnight. What is your USB? And if you don't have a USB, I need to know why you don't have a USB. And last but not least, that is a part. We are a bank. I think it's stuck. There you are. Right up there. There you go. Uh oh. There you go. Level five leadership. Now, why is that critically important, particularly with the, you know, with the founding 100? You know, it's like we have a blind spot in our development when we talk about business ownership and we talk about entrepreneurship. There's a big difference between business ownership and entrepreneurship. There are five phases to entrepreneurship, and you heard me say this before. I'm not going to beat you over the head. There are five phases of entrepreneurship. Number one, it's called new venture. What in the world is new venture? You've got the idea in your head. You're working for corporate America, but you know after three, four, five years, you're out here, you're going to launch your business. Number two is startup. That's when you're launching your business. That's when you've got the overhead. That's when you've got the light switch on, turn up the business card, turn up the website, do whatever you've got to do. But number three, third phase of entrepreneurship seems to be a stumbling block for black America. Why? That's when you move from entrepreneur to manager. And what's critical about managing, planning, organization control is team building. Now, I said we've got a sort of a blind spot between business owners and entrepreneurs. 99.9% of black businesses are sold proprietorship. Sole proprietorship. Now, that can be done by design. There's nothing wrong with sole proprietorship. But if entrepreneurship is your goal, sooner or later, you've got to move from entrepreneur to manager. 
Yeah, we don't want to manage people. And I said people don't care about you until they realize how much you care about them. And it is through your team that you problem solve. Don't listen to me. Go read Malcolm Gladwell's marketing book. And he didn't promote it as a marketing book. But all your top business schools make sure that their students read Tipping Point. Go read me 330 pages, or you can come over and we can go have you and I get a beer and I'll tell you what you need to know about Tipping Point. <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell says in that book, Any Problem. Any Problem, Malcolm? I said Any Problem. Shaving bumps? Any Problem. Bloodshot eyes? Any Problem. Athletes flip? Any Problem. Homelessness? Any problem. Can't find the follow with a roadmap? Any problem. Hey, just dropped out, can't find a pass calculus? Any problem. Can be solved. If only enough people care. If only enough people care. You hear me, entrepreneur? You're an entrepreneur because you want to believe what you want to believe. Or well, if you can bring somebody on the team, they want to believe what they want to believe. People don't care about you until they realize how much you care about them. Well, I'm about to sit down, but I got to tell you this. I was on a radio interview. Guy calls me up and says, "Could you just share a few words about Robert Smith? Man, getting the money in Morehouse, but man, forgiveness, man. You know, forty million dollars, blah blah blah." And I said, "Man, that was a great gesture." And, you know, and I, I, I wanted to interview Robert Smith when I was writing the Wealth Choice, but my editor and uh, folks at um, McMillan said, come on, we are back. <coughs> you just can't keep interviewing folks. We have to shut it down, right? No problem. But he asked me, man, you know, can you just say a few words about Robert Smith? And I said, man, that's just a grand gesture to share his love like that. And I said, that's what we need. We need more wealth creators and whatever. But I said, the only way that Robert Smith could do that, I said, he just followed the lead of a little black woman in Mississippi. Who I spent six hours with by the name of Osceola McCarter. And I said, yeah, that was a great gift that Robert Smith did. He gave, you know, equivalent to $40 million. But that little black marsh woman by the name of Osceola McCarty, she gave more than $40 million. She gave it all. She gave every dime that she had. <coughs> Started working at age eight, didn't quit to age 84. She advanced more than $250,000 with her weekly deposits at the bank. Didn't even know how much money she had in the bank. So she got a phone call from a banker. And a banker said,